On the morning of May 10, 1940, the armies of Nazi Germany attacked the Netherlands, spreading death and destruction. In three days, the country was overrun. The Dutch surrendered, and the dark night of Nazi occupation settled over the land. As in all of Europe, where Hitler's armies had conquered, Jews were in grave danger. The Nazis began rounding up Dutch Jews and sending them to concentration camps and to their deaths. Some among the Dutch resisted and offered help to their fellow citizens who were Jews, even at the risk of their own lives. Among them was Diet Amman, then a 20-year-old woman whose Christian conscience would not allow her to sit idly by. Well, I worked in the bank in the international section, and next to me was a Jewish guy, and he worked there too, and his name was Herman, and he loved to play violin, and my brother plays beautiful cello. He, he was in many orchestras, he could have been a professional, and I play horrible piano. <laughs> but Herman wanted to play trios, so he came often to our house, and he became a friend. Diet Eman. Her fiancé, Heinz Sietzma, and others hid Jews with Christian Dutch farm families and provided food and crucial ration cards for them. Can we do what can we do? You can't let that pass. That our friends, and they hadn't done any crime, and we didn't know later that they would be killed. But then Hein got a great idea because his father was principal of a Christian grade school, and they had Ten, he was the oldest of ten children, and he said, "Did I know all those farmers? The kids, they sent the kids to my father's school, and we get our milk and our butter and our cheese, and I know them all. And he said, if I hop on the train, because we lived in The Hague, and this was Nijkerk, he said, if I hop on the train and I ask any of those farmers, will you take Herman till the end of the war, they'll say yes. So we called Herman back, and I met him again, and I told him. And he said, yes, please, and my sister and my girlfriend and the mother of my girlfriend. <laughs> and in a few weeks, we had about, I think that we had around 60 people that we found places for. Towards the end of the war, Hein was caught by the Nazis and was sent to Dachau concentration camp in Germany, where he died in January of 1945. By their courageous actions, Diet and Hein have given us a moving example of what solidarity with others in need means. Today, Diet still testifies to the love of Christ that led her to stand in solidarity with her fellow Dutch citizens who were Jews. We thought that's what Jesus would have done. I mean, do unto others what you want others to do unto you. I mean, definitely did not want to leave our home, so you had to help. That's what we felt was God's will. You had to, it was not a matter, do you like it? it? It was really a matter of obedience. And then you have to trust God. And I mean, it was hard that I didn't come back and first I didn't want to live either, I wanted to die because from the 15 guys of our group, eight never came back. And I didn't want to live either. And then slowly it dawns on you. If you're not taken, God has other plan plans. The, the parable of the Good Samaritan is a, a wonderful lesson that Jesus taught about solidarity. Uh, for one thing, it was the solidarity between the Samaritan and the victim lying along the side of the road. Uh, that he saw a person in need. And it was a Samaritan looking at a Jew and saying, uh, I need to help that person. Why? Because that person is another human being who's desperately in need. And I'm obligated to stop and to uh, serve the needs of that person. But th there's another layer to the story, and that is that uh, Jesus was telling this to Jews who didn't like Samaritans. And he was wanting them to see the Samaritan as a good example to them, as someone who they should feel solidarity with, as uh, someone who understood the need to serve those who are helpless. Yeah, when I think of solidarity, the first thing that comes to mind is the biblical pa passage in which Cain kills Abel and God says, where is your brother? And, and Cain cynically says, am I my brother's keeper? Um, and I sometimes get tears in my eyes when I think about that, that passage in the Bible. To me, that's 
the crux of some of the situations we're in today in which many of us are standing around cynically asking, well, am I my brother's keeper? Should I really be concerned about people dying of AIDS in Africa? Or should I really be concerned about poor people in the inner city? Um, the answer in scripture overwhelmingly is yes, we are our brother's keeper. The, the solidarity principle is one of the key principles in all of scripture to best understand how we should engage as evangelical Christians in the political arena. We need to carefully consider exactly what solidarity is, how it is taught in scripture, and what it means for us today. Solidarity is undoubtedly a Christian virtue. One's neighbor is then a living image of God the Father, redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. One must be ready for sacrifice, even the ultimate one, to lay down one's life. Solidarity is, I would say it is probably as polar opposite a concept as you can get from the idea of the individual sovereign self. Um, you can't separate the individual from the human community in Catholic social teaching and Catholic social thought. Um, the individual is a part of a human family uh, that extends not only to one's own literal family and community and friends, but uh, really the whole human family, uh, and as well, and, uh, frankly, as persons who may even be um, considered strangers or even enemies. Uh, so uh, individual need, individual material want, uh, solidarity basically is a clarion call to consider the well-being of others in virtually everything that we do. I, I agree with De Julio's basic yeah. mm -hmm. notion that we as Christians have to be concerned about the good of others and we have to see others' humanity, even in our enemies, recognize their humanity and take into consideration their needs. And uh, I think it definitely represents the ideal mm -hmm. of solidarity because there's you know, uh, neither male nor female, neither Greek nor Jew, and uh, on down the line, um, and that's a really difficult concept, I think, for myself and others as Christians to deal with. Um, but it, it's ultimately what Christ would want. I think of like coming alongside someone. Like if you choose solidarity mm -hmm. with a group, you're choosing to come alongside them. Like someone who moves into a very low income neighborhood, not because they need a low income housing situation, mm -hmm. but because they want to come alongside that the people that live there and say, I value you. you, your neighborhood is worth living in. Clearly, solidarity is a Christian virtue. We are to love our neighbors as ourselves. But that still leaves us with the so what question. When and how should we translate our Christ-motivated concern for those in need into positions on the public policy controversies of the day? Let no one pretend this is an easy question. One thing is clear. Sometimes our politicians, in their drive to get our votes, ask us the wrong question. Next Tuesday is election day. Next Tuesday, all of you will go to the polls, will stand there in the polling place and make a decision. I think when you make that decision, it might be well if you would ask yourself, are you better off than you were four years ago? Um. I don't, I don't know that it's a good question to ask. Um, it's an individualistic question to ask, am I better off? And if you're gonna vote based on that. Uh, in some regards, I think though that it's a terrible question, if we think about it from a Christian uh, perspective. Solidarity says that Ronald Reagan here asked the wrong question. For Christians, the question is not whether or not we are personally better off today, but whether our neighbors and our country as a whole are better off. You know, I, I think far too often we reach for politics first and we don't give due consideration to what we can do personally or what we can do locally as a church or what we can do in nonprofit organizations. And um, so I, I guess that's why I'm troubled by how solidarity is often interpreted. It seems like the people who talk about solidarity uh, most often um, are the ones that are most quickly reaching for politics, and that, that leaves me really troubled. It's wrong to interpret solidarity to mean we should quickly turn to government whenever we see needs about which solidarity has moved us to be concerned. However, and this is equally true, it is also wrong to interpret solidarity to mean 
that we should never turn to government when we see a need. After all, government is the God-given means to promote greater justice in our land. We need to be guided by specific circumstances and conditions. The well-known Catholic scholar and former member of the Bush administration, John DeJulio, has struck, I believe, the right balance. You don't turn to government first. You can't be addicted to government when it comes to helping the poor and the needy, but neither should you be allergic to government. And the obligation is to first do what you can do as an individual. That is, help should be delivered where possible, up close and personal. But if and when you're up against a social need that is bigger than you and maybe bigger than your family, your community, your network of churches and so forth, then you have a positive moral obligation to continue to seek help and engage others to meet the needs of the poor or the needy or the neglected or the sick or the elderly or the dying. Um, and that requirement will sometimes re bring one to call upon the largest community, say the national political community represented by our democratic government.